Welcome to the Open Forum. My, my, how time flies by. And when we look at, see that number 21, April 21, we know that therefore we are just one year and one month from that great day, the day of judgment. Oh, my, it's also a great day because it'll be the day when the salvation of all the true believers will be completed because on that day we will receive our glorified spiritual bodies and be caught up to be forevermore with Christ. And uh, But my, 13 months, that doesn't take long to go by. And isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that God gives us this kind of warning so that that day doesn't just come upon us like a thief in the night, like a great, great many people wish it would be that way, but it isn't that way. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it'll be May 21, 2011, when these awesome events will occur. And uh, But it's the mercy of God that we can still cry out if we are at all concerned about our salvation. And uh, we, uh, this is a very serious matter, because if we're not saved, uh, there's no question at all we'll be entering into the day of judgment which will go on for the next 153 days after after it begins and my my uh, how I, I i can't i can't be thankful enough to know that god has in his mercy told us that given us this detail and that at the same time he tells us without question that today many 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 people are becoming saved. Uh, there's nothing they can do to get themselves saved, but as they cry out for mercy, oh Lord, is it possible? Is it possible? As they recognize that they deserve the wrath of God, and yet they're pleading with God, could it be some of them will also become saved? And uh, this will include, especially according to what we read in the Bible, those who know very, very little about the Bible, they are the last to hear. And uh, 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 therefore, we would say they don't have a chance. No, that isn't the way it is. The fact is, well, unfortunately, as we study the Bible, we find that those who believe they know the Bible quite well because they have been in a church for a long time will be last. Whereas the those who are are last to hear the word of God will be first. And that means that those who think that they know it all and are prepared for whenever it happens, let Christ come as a thief in the night, the Bible assures us they will be going into judgment day. How awful. But this is your program, and we are... We're, living in the most serious days that ever the world ever had. And, uh, uh, well, maybe not, because in the days of Noah, they also were heading for a judgment that was going to come upon the whole world and did come in exact agreement with what God had declared it would be coming. And it will, it will also be true now as God is preparing to end this world's existence. But shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. You say that Jesus paid for sin in eternity past. And when he went to the cross, that was just a demonstration. So how do you explain John 7, verse 39? John 7, verse 39. John 7 verse 39 but this spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the holy ghost was not yet given because that jesus was not yet glorified now first of all this has to be read in the light of what was going on in that day and god had christ was right near the beginning of the church age where his plan was that the uh 
the organization that would begin to represent the kingdom of God in the world was, would no longer be the nation of Israel, but the church age. And the, the beginning of the church age began when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And that was not to come until Christ had demonstrated how he had made payment for sin. And then uh, he went back to heaven. And then a few days later, he, he uh, began his program to evangelize the whole world. And that's what is talking about here. The Holy Spirit was then given. And uh, you see, if, if he had not made payment before the foundation of the world then how in the world could Moses have become saved or Enoch or, or Abel? How could they become saved if Christ had not, uh, had not already made payment for their sins? Uh, how could they be forgiven if payment had not been made? But, uh, uh, have you any idea how that could have happened? For example, we read in... in uh, Hebrews that without the shedding of blood there's no remission and uh, he did not he did shed his blood uh, on, in AD 33 but the world had already been going on for 11,000 years how in the world did David get saved or Abraham or any of them have you thought about that it says the Holy Ghost was not yet given it was prevented from being given because he didn't do his demonstration first well, uh, okay, our caller has left our line, so we'll have to go to our next caller. Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, uh, Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. Verse 31. Verse 31. There we read, Look not upon the wine when it is red, for when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Uh, now, what is your question? A few days ago, you had a caller. Uh, she had asked about um, uh, reference to uh, wine and drunkenness in one of the prophets. I think it was Jeremiah or Isaiah. And you had said that the drunkenness there referred to uh, spiritual blindness. But I, I remember that just before the call ended, you, you did allude to this verse, uh, verse 31, uh, that it was referring to physical drunkenness. Well, uh, it, it, I, I, I've been wrestling with these few verses for a while. Verse 29 got my attention. While, while at first glance it seems to read as though the, uh, these are the consequences of being drunk, what stood out to me anyway uh, as allusions to Christ was, uh, who hath wounds without cause, and the only person that I can think of who was wounded, what that term, that phrase, without cause, uh, clearly alludes to Christ. And also, who hath redness of eyes, which is a, uh, which is a repeat of, um, of Genesis, uh, what is it, Genesis 49:12, where it speaks about Christ coming with his teeth are white with milk and his eyes are red with wine. So, anyway, not that I understand it, but I'm wondering what you think about that. It's yeah, well, the fact is, now, let's look. Remember, Christ spoke in parables. Yes. And, uh, and drunkenness has some kind of spiritual meaning. Now, if you go to Isaiah 28, go Isaiah 28, verse 7. Right, But right. they have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They, they err in vision. They stumble in judgment, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness as there is no place now it's it's uh, uh, it's talking here about those who are going after other kinds of gospels it is uh, the and and uh, when we read uh, uh, deuteronomy 21 for example deuteronomy these uh, 
uh, uh, we, we read there where God talks about somebody who has been rebellious and, and uh, the elders want him uh, under the, to be under the wrath of God. And we, uh, the formula that was used was in verse 20 of Deuteronomy 21. Uh, this, our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard, and all the men of the city shall stone him with stones. And remember, they accused Jesus of being a drunkard and a, uh, and a, uh, uh, a glutton, uh, using slightly different language, but essentially the same, because they accused him of, of drunkenness. And it, Jesus never touched wine, but the fact is that they are using this formula that he is a son of Israel. He was of the tribe of Judah, and he is not not obeying the rules of the synagogue, of the temple, of the priest. He is teaching other things. He is rebellious, and he ought to be killed. And uh, that all uh, that all has to do with spiritual activity not physical drunkenness at all. Right, right. Uh, one more question. Isaiah uh, chapter 8, verse 18. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. We read, Behold, I am the children whom Jehovah hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Jehovah of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Uh, right, my question is, um, it's, uh, since in that verse God is, re- is referring to uh, Christ and I would assume the true believers as signs and wonders, then would you say it's a fair uh, assessment or a fair comparison to couple that with Second Thessalonians 2 where it talks about lying signs and wonders that uh, that the lying signs and wonders would be the false believers uh, in the last day? I mean, would that be uh, a oh, fair way to determine? Because I've had that question yeah. asked to me. Well, what will, in other words, people are assuming that the lying signs and wonders are going to be these supernatural events and these yeah, spectacular well, that, things. That, that, that is also possible, that, that if you tie it back to Isaiah chapter 8, I don't think that that's an impossible idea. That's something that we can think about. Okay. Anyway, you're doing a great job. Thank you, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Um, uh, I just had a couple quick questions for you. Um, I've been following your studies and stuff, and I really like what you have to say. Um, uh, my first question is on Matthew 24, 7. Um, Matthew 24, 7. Let's look at that. Matthew 24, verse 7. We read, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, what is your question about that? Uh, I was just wondering, I mean, I've heard you say that earthquakes don't really have any, like, um like the, the earthquakes now don't really mean anything, but like I, I just don't understand what this is saying then. Well, the fact is, God is warning us. You know, Matthew 24 gets into talking about the end of time. And uh, um, I, I remember reading one time about Martin Luther, for example. He was uh, He lived about 400 years ago, approximately, and... He was. He really wanted to follow the Lord very diligently, and uh, yet he lived in a time when there was very ugly things going on politically, and and there was great persecution of the believers, and and he looked at all this horrible stuff that was he was surrounded with, and he concluded, as if I remember correctly, he concluded, you know, the the end of the world can't be more than a dozen years away uh, because look at how horrible everything is and uh, that has been the characteristic of the world throughout the world there have been wars and rumors of wars think of our own 
if you, if you're old enough, you think back 70 or 80 years, and there's never been a year when there hasn't been uh, yeah. wars going on here and there. And every year there are earthquakes, and every year there are uh, uh, terrible things going on. And God is saying, "Look, that's the beginning, but that is not." Uh, he doesn't tie that directly to the end of time. In other words, they're not signs that we're right near the end of time. They are signs that there will be an end of time, but certainly not not that we're close to the end of time. I'm, I, I can't find anything in the Bible that tells us that there will be this kind of activity greatly increased that will signify that we're right near the end. It, some of this may be greatly increased, but I'm, I don't find that God is calling our attention to it very specially. Okay. Um, also, my next question, um, somebody asked me this who isn't a believer, and um, they were wondering why is the Bible so hard to understand? I don't know. Maybe only God can answer that question, but I was just wondering. Why is the Bible so hard to understand? That's God's business, why he wrote the Bible the way he did. And I'll tell you, indeed, it is very hard to understand, and, uh, and uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it is absolutely, on top of that, it's necessary that uh, no matter how we search the Bible, God has to open our spiritual eyes before we do come to truth. And uh, that's because God has knows exactly who he has saved, that is, whom he, whom, who he has, uh, 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 whose sins he has paid for, and he has a time when they are to become saved because when they become come into existence at some time before they die, if their sins have been paid for, God has to give them a new eternal soul, which is what salvation is all about. But all of that is God's plan. He is entirely in charge, and he does everything perfectly. We just have to, uh, 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 for one thing, by making it hard to understand, the, it helps us to search and search and search the Bible. And the more we search the Bible, the more we are going to understand or begin to get an idea of how holy God is, how wonderful he is. And, and, uh, but there are other reasons, too, very certainly. But I don't know all the reasons. God okay. does everything perfectly. Uh, also, just one last thing. I was just wondering, um, I know I've read in the Bible, um, and, and I've heard you teach this, and I believe it, that we, the, the former things won't be remembered of this world. And I was just wondering, like, I read um, somewhere, I don't remember where it was, where Jesus was being ministered to by Moses and Elijah or something, or I think it was for, I forget. Well, the, the, the verse where it talks about former things not being remembered, that's Isaiah chapter 65, where okay. God is talking right. about a new heaven and a new earth. And he says, uh, uh, he says there... Um, uh, in Isaiah chapter uh, 65, um, in verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. And that is not modified anywhere else in the Bible that I'm aware of. It stands right there and agrees with the fact that that all where it talks again and again about a, a God will bring a consumption that is a full end to everything. When you see the word consume or consumption, uh, these are words that uh, in the Hebrew means that they will it'll be they'll be totally gone forever. Okay, I was just thinking about that and how Moses like if he came and like talked to Jesus while Jesus was on earth like. Maybe that's only for God to know, but, like, what would Moses, you know, like, how, what would he have thought? You know, like, he's in heaven, and if he can't remember things on earth, and then he's coming back to earth, that's what made me kind of, like, my mind kind of started spinning when I thought about that, you know? Well, I, yeah, we, we can't put, put ourselves into the minds of Moses yeah. or anybody else, but 
we do have the Bible, and that is where we got to focus upon, not upon Moses, but okay. upon the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Pump to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camden. Yes. Uh, I received your tracks, and I really loved it. I, all of it lined up perfectly, I mean, just perfectly with the Bible. And I, I, I hesitated at first. I couldn't throw away the idols and put away the, all the things that, and it just, it just got to me. I just, I, I just. I had to get more tracks. I had to pass these out. This is this has got to be heard. No, what are you? And this is this whole whole thing that you you've got going here. I I know that you donate your time. Bless you. I want to just say that I hope you live for forever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. As far as you go. Excuse me. Do you have a question? Uh, Isaiah thirty-eight eight refers to Isaiah 38 uh, 8 yeah let's look at that verse 8 yeah a little bit of confusion there it's a oh, Isaiah 38 verse 8 there we read Isaiah 38 verse 8 behold I will bring again the shadow of of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz 10 degrees backwards, so the sun returned 10 degrees by which degrees it had gone down. This is a sign that God is giving to Hezekiah that who had been dying, and now God has said, I know, uh, or uh, he had been told he would be dying immediately. And uh, then God, uh, Hezekiah prayed, prayed and beseeched the Lord, and he was given 15 more years, and uh, as a sign that indeed he would continue to live 15 more years, God gave, uh, ca caused the shadow on the sundial to go down 10 degrees, which is an enormous action, because to have that happen means that the whole universe, the whole solar system, the whole celestial time clock had to be... Uh, Readjust it, <laughs> and who can do that but God? Yeah, it yeah. Simply indicates that God is the one who who uh, created the world and and can, and has it in His hand, so that He can do anything He wants with the world. Uh, it is just amazing. Now, did uh, it was someplace else in the Bible where He stopped the sun for a whole day? Was it? Was it in, in well, that's in the book of Joshua, where the sun was stopped for uh, for a while, uh, and uh, that's it, that's it for several hours as Joshua was fighting with the enemy. And there again, it's the same thing. Now, it didn't it it, it didn't affect uh, uh, this whole business of knowing what the hour in the day is, because we have no idea what hour of the day creation occurred. We don't have any idea what hour of the day the flood began. It's, we just know the day. And uh, so these activities that we're le re reading about did not affect that. Oh, yeah, regardless of that, I mean, Christ still died on the cross at that time. And then from then forward, I understand that. Yeah. It's just these, these well, uh, times. Thank, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Camping. How you doing? Very well, thank you. Uh, Revelation 17, verse uh, 8 or 9. Start out with uh, wise, the word wise, please. Revelation chapter 17. I it's verse, uh, nine. verse 8 and 9. There we read, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall worship. Who's, uh, and they that dwell on the earth shall worship, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Now, what is your question? Or oh, in verse 9, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman... Sitteth. 
What is your question? Um, it says, be wise to this. Uh, what are the seven heads? What are the seven heads and the seven mountains? Right. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, the, let's look at this again. The uh, woman, the woman which thou sawest, or uh, we're looking at verse oh, verse eight. The beast that saw it shall ascend, and and whose names it doesn't talk about seven heads here. Uh, or that's in verse 7. Uh, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now the seven heads represent the re reign of Satan throughout time. For the first 11,000 years of the history of the world, he was, he was, uh, in, uh, he was actually put in charge of ruling over mankind. And... Uh, and uh, during the, uh, uh, and again, he was very active in, uh, in harassing the churches, although he had no official rule uh, throughout the church age. But that, uh, that seven heads have to do with the, uh, the total rule of Satan throughout the history of the world. Now, the seven mountains are, the word seven signifies completeness, uh, perfect completeness, and it really relates to all the kingdoms. The mountain is very frequently used in the Bible as a portrait or picture of a political kingdom. And uh, Satan has ruled over all of the, uh, all over the political kingdoms of the world for the first 11,000 years, and he presently is again during this time of great tribulation. And that uh, that uh, is signified by the seven mountains. But thank you for calling in. And incidentally, the the seven horns that uh, uh, they really uh, focus on the reign of Satan during this period of great tribulation, this final 23 years. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Thank you for taking my call tonight. I really, I have two questions. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, will you hold on? I'll be right back with you right after this message. Continuing with the open forum, and we have a caller on the line. What is your question? Uh, yes, Mr. Camping, could you please turn to Exodus 4, verses 25 and 26? Exodus 4, verse 25 and 26? Yes. Yes. And I have a question. Exodus 4, verse 25 and 26. Uh, uh, I believe that's where it's teaching that Moses is on his way to uh, to uh, uh, go into Egypt to lead the the uh, nation of Israel out of Egypt, and uh, while he's going there, we find that uh, 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 God begins to kill him, and uh, it says in verse 24, it came to pass. By the way, in the end. That is, as they were on their way from, from uh, where he had been living out in the de out in the uh, Sinai de or out in the Ara uh, the uh, 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 yes the uh, the desert of uh, of Arabia. It came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him, Jehovah met him, and sought to kill him. Wow! Tried to kill Moses. Then Zipporah, that was his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Now, what is going on here? What is uh, happening? You see, uh, God is using Moses here as a portrait, as a picture of the Messiah. Uh, when when uh, God had instituted uh, circumcision back in Exodus, I believe it was in Exodus 17, he had made a law there that uh, in verse 14 of Exodus 17, that the uncircumcised man child, and that was like the son of Moses and Zipporah, he had not been circumcised, 
The uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now, literally, physically, it meant, therefore, that since the son of, of Moses and Zipporah had not been circumcised uh, by their parents, it meant that that son should die, according to verse 14 here of Genesis 17. But here, God is killing Moses. Now, what is that a picture of? Who are those who deserve to die? Well, the whole human race, because we're all sinners. Spiritually, we're all uncircumcised. But there are certain ones that Christ himself had died and made the payment for their sins, had died for and made the payment for their sins, so that they, these individuals did not come under the wrath of God. That's what salvation is all about. So Moses, or God is demonstrating his salvation plan here, making Moses a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his uncircumcised son, a picture of those who Christ came to save, to, to, uh, to pay the pay penalty of sin for. And, uh, and uh, then, uh, you remember, Zeborah took a sharp stone and cut off the a foreskin of her uh, that has circumcised her son and then said to Moses, Thou art a bloody husband to me. And that is exactly uh, what Christ is to us. He's a bloody husband. We become the bride of Christ, but he shed his blood. He shed his blood. That is, he gave his life already before the foundation of the world that we might be saved. So Mr. Camping Zipporah is a picture of Christ in, in verse 25, and Moses would be a picture of the law? No, no. Zipporah is a picture of... Uh, um, Moses is a picture of Christ. He is the one who died for our sins. Uh, her son is a picture of the believer. Zipporah is, uh, in, in this verse 25, really a picture of the of the body of believers. We are the bride oh, of Christ who are married when we become truly saved. We're married to a husband who shed his blood. Okay. I have one more question, Mr. Uh, Camping. Yes. Could you please, please turn to John 5, verse 21 and 25, and could you please tell me... John 5. Virtually. John 5. Verse 21 and 25. There we read, John 5, verse 21, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and, and uh, quickeneth them, that is, give them life, so even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that here shall live. Now, what is your question? Okay, in verse 25, is the dead, the spiritual dead, and then when they hear the word of God, and they, yes. and they yes. here shall say he gives them eternal life? Yes. Is that, no, that, is, that, that would have to be, because there's no yeah. physically dead people that right. hear, or today hear the voice of God and, and arise. That will happen on the... Uh, uh, on the day of judgment, but uh, uh, that the spiritual, that even those, uh, those, those who are in the grave will hear his voice and the true believers' bodies will be resurrected alive. Uh, the bones or the corpse or whatever is left of the unsaved will simply be re resurrected to be thrown out on the, uh, on the uh, ground uh, where they uh, will... Uh, be shamed in the eyes of God. What about verse 21? What What is that? All right, now, verse 21. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, and gives them alive, even so the Son gives alive whom he will. Because I and the Father are one. When we're talking, we're now talking about God. 
And immediately we talk about God. We say, I, I hear what God is saying. I don't understand it. But we do know that in, in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so there's, when, whether we're talking about the Father or the Lord Jesus Christ, we're talking about God, God. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is particularly a phrase focused on God making payment for our sins. Uh, uh, and uh, the word Father is particularly focused on the fact of God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. But frankly, you, uh, uh, God is God, whether we're talking about the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he raises up the dead spiritually, I, I imagine, in this case. Uh, oh, well, he uh, yes, the... the uh, every everyone who becomes a true believer is given a brand new eternal soul that is uh, uh, where our old soul was dead and now it's been raised up as a brand new eternal soul just as those who are believers and have died and their bodies have uh, are totally dead will be resurrected a brand new eternal spiritually spiritual body in which they'll be alive forevermore but thank you for calling yeah, in thank you, Mr. and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum welcome thank you mr camping first i have a question before i give you my scriptural citation um what is your opinion about the spiritual maturity of so many people who call you and want to have the body they have on earth resurrected, recognizing their wives and sons and daughters and mothers and families and friends. Can you give me your opinion about the spiritual maturity of those people? Well, the, the fact is that we're either a child of God or we're not a child of God. If we are saved, then we are eternally secure in Christ because we have a new eternal soul. And that, in that sense, we are spiritually mature. Before we are saved, we are not spiritual really at all. We are... Uh, we are uh, uh, we are uh, living here uh, without salvation, and uh, uh, I, that's not quite. I, I didn't say that quite yeah, right. There like are the those carnal, who the there God. are those who are called uh, orphans or or widows or strangers, and that's a reference to those whom whose whom God has already paid for their sins before because he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But he has not applied that at all to that individual. So that individual is just as sinful as anybody else. Uh, and he has no idea that he has been, uh, that he's going to become saved. Only God knows that. Uh, and at some time in that person's life, God will apply uh, will give that person a new uh, eternal soul. But uh, we can't look, we can't, nobody can know before they have become saved whether they, God plans to save them or not. We absolutely cannot know that. That's why we come to God pleading and pleading and begging and, oh Lord, thou art a merciful God. Could it be? that you might have mercy on me and we wait upon God we beg him and in the meanwhile we uh, we try to be obedient to the word of God and and God gives us a lot of hope that out of these there will be those who will become saved but there's no individual of any of any kind no individual that can know ahead of time God is going to save me I also would like you to look at 1 Corinthians 15.50. And I think this alone should convince people who keep calling and asking that same question. 1 oh, Corinthians dog, chapter I, 15, verse 50. 1 Corinthians 
15, verse 50? Yes. Okay. There we read, um, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you, a mystery we shall not all sleep, but will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. In other words, if, uh, if, uh, if, if it's only if God uh, changes us that then we become incorruptible. But if he doesn't change us, then we're, we, we can't go from corruption to uh, non-corruption. That is nothing that we can achieve at all. God has to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Well, thank you for taking my call. Good evening, Brother Camping. Uh, in, in your opinion, was uh, Samson a believer or not saved? We can know he was a believer because he, uh, we can't know it when we read his exploits and his lifestyle and so on. He, exactly. He was a judge, and, uh, and if we were trying to make an, a, a decision about Samson based on what we read there, we'd have to say, no, there's no, uh, we, we could not be sure, although, uh, he, uh, uh, you know, finally he was brought down all the way. He was... Uh, he was uh, killed by the enemy, or, right. or, or as he well, actually, he killed the enemy. Yeah, he brought and, down. And, he brought and down in the, the whole process, building. he died, which mean, meant that at that point he was really a picture of Christ. But the reason we can know he was saved is because he is named along with Abraham and Moses and a whole lot of other people that obviously that were definitely saved in Hebrews chapter 11. And if he had not been named there, we would have to say, from everything we can read, the likelihood is he was not saved. Right. In your opinion, was he saved at the end of his life, or was he saved according, from the beginning? According the... to Hebrews 11, I would have to say he was saved. Beginning because, of his life or at the end? Because he is... Uh, he he was not in rebellion okay. at the end at all. He wasn't serving other gods at all. Uh, he, uh, he he uh, he he was a judge of God, and and uh, it, it, there's no evidence that he made false uh, 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 made uh, altars to false gods or anything like so Solomon did, for example. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 to 27. Ezekiel chapter 36. Let's turn to that. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27. There we read, Then will I sprinkle clean, these are these beautiful water uh, words of, of salvation. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, and I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you, and and so on. You notice where the focus is. It's on God. I, 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 I. It is God who does it all. Uh, and the, 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 the person being saved uh, does nothing, nothing. I will take you from among the heathen, and so on. I will be sanctifying you before their eyes in the verse before. Yeah. You always teach that uh, that when someone gets saved, they have a new soul. But it says right in that verse, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. So why do you always say new soul? 
Well, the fact we when we read the Bible, we find that God uses words like mind and heart and spirit and soul somewhat interchangeably. It's not true at all. Because if you look into the Hebrew, the word spirit and the word soul are two different Hebrew words. Well, there. Excuse me. I didn't say they were not different words. But the fact is, when God says, "I will give you a new heart," that that is a synonym for "I will give you a new soul." No, it's not. The word "heart" means wisdom and understanding. I will give you a new wisdom, and I will give you a new understanding. That's what the word "heart" means. It has nothing to do with soul. God said when He created Adam, He said, "I made He breathed in him, and I gave you a living soul." The Bible does not say anything about the spirit being the soul. You always teaching that when and Christ says that uh, excuse you me. will be Thank, a born of the spirit. Uh, 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 excuse me. If you were the host of this program, then you would you could teach that, uh, which I, I, I disagree with entirely. But the but uh, since you're not the host, I'm sorry. You're going to have to find some place else to teach what you're teaching. Because on this program we are, we are, uh, uh, we're trying to answer questions, and if you can show something from the Bible that shows that we're uh, incorrect, then then of course we'll be corrected. But the fact is that whether God is talking about the soul of man or the heart of man, or the mind of man, he, uh, in the depending on the context, it's all he's talking about the fact that we are we have a spiritual aspect of our life that makes us different from animals animals are body and spirit or breath the word spirit is also used as a synonym for breath mankind is like the animal in that we have a body we're like the animal in that we have breath which is sometimes called the spirit and we also have a spiritual essence that is called the soul or our heart or the or the spirit or uh, and uh, and uh, then we when we understand that we'll find we are in harmony all through the word of god but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum good evening brother camping yes I'm, I would like you to read Ezekiel 33, uh, verse 2 through 7. Ezekiel 33, verse 2 to 7. Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth a sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet uh, and took not warning. His blood should be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the, he that, yeah, he that taketh warning, that is, give the warning. But if the watchman set the sword, see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. Now, what is your question? Uh, I'm, it, I'm trying to figure out, is that saying that if we do not, in this day and age, not warn the people of what's to come uh, next year, that it would be held, we would be held accountable for that? Well, you see, uh, yes, yes, that's what you're learning here. You see, God has put the true believer here to be his ambassador. And uh, but, and uh, when we are saved, we're not saved uh, just so that I am now a child of God and I can leave, live a better life and I don't care a hang about uh, the rest of the people of the world. 
when a person becomes saved, he is a, represent a representative of the kingdom of God and is to be concerned about the salvation of others and, and as best he can. Uh, and every one of us have different uh, abilities and, and opportunities and so on, but I should have an intent, have an, a desire that those uh, around them, around him, can also become saved and, and in the measure that they're qualified and able and have opportunity, they should be sharing the gospel. Now, at the end of time, the b big warning that has to go out is Judgment Day is, uh, is here. It's about to come. And just like Noah was commanded to warn the world of his day, and just as Jonah was sent to the uh, city, the wicked city of Nineveh, in his day to warn, so the true believers are also to, uh, because they're true believers, they understand, they believe what the Bible is saying about this. And they realize the, the enormous significance of this. And we live in a world where, where people are going their own sweet way and care less about the Word of God, and we, uh, we should be trying to warn them. Now, we, every one of us doesn't have the same opportunity, nor are we all uh, designed the same. Some people, uh, they have a penchant for a, a real knack or a real uh, happiness in passing out tracks, passing out tracks, and oh, uh, uh, and others they they that just isn't their thing. But they are praying for their loved ones, and they are uh, uh, when opportunity arises, they are uh, uh, warning that you know we are getting near the end. The date is so and so. But that will be the nature of a true believer, is that he wants, we're commanded here in Ezekiel, mm -hmm. uh, that we are to uh, warn as best we can. It seems like that's just another proof that God will reveal uh, to the believers the end of time. If he's telling the watchman that it's our job to warn them, and yet it seems like so many people are fighting against the fact that we do in fact know when the judgment is coming. Well, it, it, it absolutely is. This would not make, these verses would not make any sense unless the believers knew the time of his coming. This simply harmonizes with everything else that we've been talking about in connection with the timing of the end. And that's what, you know, I, I have found this, and it's a great joy. Oh, it's a wonderful joy. And that is, when you finally get a doctrine correct, and we don't always get it correct the first time around. Maybe we've had to, we've uh, we thought we had it correct, and then a little bit later we had to say, "Oh, I was mistaken," and and we have to make a correction. But when we get it correct, we have the joy of finding that it locks together with everything else that we have found already to be true. And that gives us a real happiness because we, we know I must have, God must have, God in his mercy must have direct me, uh, directed me to truth in that doctrine also because it all fits together more and more. It makes the other doctrines that I've already learned uh, even more, uh, uh, more uh, in evidence that they are accurate. But thank you, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Candy. Yes. Uh, the see, Bible teaches us that we should tithe. If we leave the church, where do we send our tithing? If we leave the church, where do we send the tithes? Well, the tithes have to do with bringing people to hear the gospel and we don't require the church in order that uh, the gospel can go out as a matter of fact we wouldn't want to send anybody to the church because there Satan is ruling today but we're living in a world of seven billion people 
And two-thirds of them know nothing at all about a church where Christ is taught, and yet they, too, need to hear the gospel. And so we can send, we can get them, uh, send them that information in any way that we can. We can do it ourselves by giving them Bibles, or we can uh, put our... Uh, uh, put our money together with others like they do in family radio so that we can uh, get it out by the message out by radio or whatever. <laughs> so if I left the church and wanted to send the tithe, what would you suggest I tithe to? Because the Bible teaches us to tithe. You send your... You, uh, you, you, you remember... You want to share the gospel with others, and you can think that out. You pray about it. You seek wisdom. Uh, there are some people that send it to fam family radio, and we use it to send out the gospel on their behalf. We have to pause. We're continuing with the open forum, and I believe we have a caller on the line. Go ahead with your call. Shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Yes, go ahead with your call. Uh, John 6, verse 53. John 3. 6, verse 53. Yes. John 6, verse 53. Yes, is that about the Holy Communion? Then the Jews said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except yes. ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Uh, that is, well, it actually uh, is, is talking about something that's far more important than the communion service. The communion service typifies that, but the fact is that we have to receive, to eat the flesh of Christ means to receive our life from him to uh, because when we eat food we eat food in order to gain uh, physical life and when we are become a child of god we get spiritual life strictly because christ laid his life down for us and the same way with drinking his blood he uh, he shed his blood he gave his life in order that we might have life. Okay. And it was typified by the Lord's Supper. Remember, there it says that as often as you eat this bread and drink this uh, cup, uh, uh, you remember the Lord's death that's pointing back at what Christ did in the, uh, all the way back at the beginning of, uh, uh, before the beginning of time when he made payment for our sins until he comes and is looking forward to the completion of our salvation, which will come when we receive our, our glorified spiritual bodies, and that will be when he comes and the day of judgment, which is also the day of the rapture. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I got a couple verses and a question. Uh, Matthew 3.11. Matthew 3, verse 11. Yes, sir. Let's look at that. Matthew 3. Verse 11. There we read, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, what is your question? Um, uh, a couple of days ago, a caller called about baptism, and uh, you explained to her there's nothing in the Bible that it says that water is used in baptism. No one to explain that to me. In, in yeah, well, the the that water is 
you oh in physical baptism oh no I never said that at all I never said that at all the physical water is commanded the water of baptism as a picture as a portrait as a sign pointing to the real baptism that is a, a coincidental with salvation water baptism doesn't save anybody it has it is simply a, a physical act that we perform and and first of all remember that there's no work that we can do in order to help get ourselves saved and that's work that we're doing applying that physical water but it is pointing uh, 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 think of this you're sitting in the congregation up in the front there's a baptismal fount up there and uh, sometimes it's very specially gloriously uh, set there and uh, there are people that are being uh, immersed in that water they're being washed in that water and the whole congregation is watching is there a change happening to those who are dri being dipped in that water absolutely not that water baptism is an action that that they are p performing with the preacher and uh, and uh, there's no possibility that that can affect their salvation in, or make them saved or help, and help them to get saved or whatever but it is a portrait to the whole congregation as they're watching you know just like water washes dirt away from the skin so we have to have the water washing of the Holy Spirit uh, the word, with the Word of God applied to our lives to wash away our sins. And that is the baptism that has to do with salvation. But that is something that God does entirely. We make no contribution to that kind of baptism. It is only typified by that which we are looking at. Okay, okay. And uh, Hebrews thirteen seventeen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. There we read, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your soul, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and, with, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. What is your question? Okay, um, well, I'm referring back to uh, that verse and also with the Matthew 16, 18, where it says, I tell you, uh, Peter, that I build my rock on this rock, I build my church, and the Hades will not overcome it. So I was wondering if the church is, is indeed over. No, the, these are... Is watching over us. I mean, you know, you're telling no, us to uh, follow the churches. And, yeah. um, I was just saying, if you can explain this to me, like, are you supposed to be the only elder that we can listen to, or... I, excuse me, the rock of Matthew sixteen eighteen. upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not Peter. Not Peter. The disciples or the preacher or the priest or any of those who have spiritual rulers or spiritual rulers over us cannot help us become saved in any okay. way because salvation is 100 percent the act of god but god had set up these physical organizations in the old testament it was the nation of israel in the new testament it is all the local churches that that uh, God uh, set up uh, d during a period of 1955 years, and and uh, they represented. They were not the kingdom of God, but they represented the kingdom of God, and and uh, the priests and the pastors, uh, they were to be hopefully uh, true to the word and, and, and assist in teaching the word, teaching the fact, teaching the fact, we, I can't do anything to get you saved. I can't help you show you how to become saved. All I can do is show you what the Bible says, that you have to wait upon the Lord. And, uh, and if they were properly teaching, 
uh, then uh, then uh, they would be really rendering a service. And then once you became saved, uh, they would further teach you in the Word of God and um, uh, how to live and so on. That was their role. But they could okay. do nothing, nothing, nothing to help you get saved. And uh, they had no authority to make any changes in the Word of God either. When we on this program, for example, sometimes say, oh, that word should have been this rather than that, that change is made not because we're changing the original language, it's because we're reading the original language more carefully than the translators did, and, and, uh, and uh, we want the, tr the translation that we're reading as accurate as possible in order to come to truth. Okay, well then, um, I just have this one verse and a question, I'll leave you alone. Um, Matthew 18.20. Matthew 18.20. Let's look at that. Matthew 18.20. On this rock I will build... Oh, no, this is 18.20, I'm sorry. Yes. 18, verse 20. There we read for... There were two or three are gathered again there in my name. There I am in the midst of them. Uh, and uh, who really, or uh, I am in, where two or three are gathered together in my name. Uh, this was the, the uh, picture of national Israel or of the church age. The churches could be as small as two or three people. Uh, it uh, it didn't have to have 200 people there or, or or 20 people. If there were as few as two or three, uh, Christ is saying if uh, that uh, uh, he was present there because God, uh, uh, throughout the church age until 1988 when Christ left the church, uh, until that time he was there for as as the gospel was was shared that uh, he would apply it to the hearts of those that he had planned uh, to save. And that's why he is there. And uh, and that's the activity that was going on in the churches. Uh, if there were people there that God had planned to save, God would apply that word to their lives, and, and they would become a child of God. Well, um, you know, though I do believe that uh, many churches, you know, have lost their way of teaching of God, but it seems like you yourself are teaching the very thing you proclaim the churches to be teaching, which is your interpretation of the Bible. And so I'm, I'm wondering which is right. Which well, is the fact wrong. is, the fact is, uh, you all... have an, you know, it seems you have an agenda, that, you know, because you, you know, obviously are a wealthy man, and uh, it's just who do we believe? It's kind of like the Watchtower, to whom is Watchtower. So I just wanted to see, you know. Well, you're, we, you're, 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 excuse I, I, me, excuse me, you don't believe me, I'm no, not an authority, and you don't believe your church, they're not an authority, the only authority is the Bible, but as your church teaches you, you check it out in the Bible, and if, if, if it consistently does not follow what the Bible says, then you know you shouldn't be there. Or if the Bible in our day warns that the churches are, are uh, that Satan is ruling there, then of course you don't want to be there. But on the same token, uh, when you hear me speak, for example, or anyone else, uh, and we say this is what the Bible teaches, don't trust me. I'm not the authority. You look at it, look for it in the Bible and see if it fits and and pray God for wisdom and and uh, because it is the Bible that is the authority that's why you'll find in family radio that what we're teaching unless we're, it's just you know, some of the very very new things we're just beginning to teach which, uh, uh, and God is still opening our eyes but but many of these uh, truths that we are teaching about Christ paying the sin for our sins before the foundation of the world or the end of the church age and, or the date of it, the rapture, uh, the date of the final end of total annihilation of the world and all these kind of things. Uh, they ha we, we have written all that down and uh, have make it available so that anybody can have that in written form. And so they have the verses right there spelled out 
and they can check it out for themselves uh, to discover whether this teacher has really been faithful in, in, in understanding what the Bible is, is teaching us. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yeah. Um, I'm calling you this evening with a couple of questions. I don't have uh, Bible verses to uh, come up with the correct answers. The first uh, question would be, uh, how long has Israel been a nation? Is it 66 years, sir? How long uh, uh, was Israel a nation? They were a, a no. nation. They were. They became a nation in 1447 B.C., and uh, they uh, they uh, were destroyed as a nation in 587 B.C. They came together again, beginning in 539 B.C., and uh, were a uh, somewhat of a nation uh, uh, in the days of Jesus. For example, they were a nation under the authority of the Roman Empire. They were not a free nation at all. And then in 70 A.D., they were completely destroyed. Then in 1948 uh, A.D., they again became a nation in the land of Israel. And presently, they are still a nation. Thank you. Did you have another question? Yes, sir. Uh, the second part to that would be, um, the Bible refers to this generation will not pass. Um, I believe uh, that ties in with 1948. If it does, being at the average age, I believe, of, of, uh, of a U.S. citizen. Or, well, it, or, it, it has two or three possibilities. The, first of all, the word generation. Is, uh, there's nothing in the Bible that a generation has to be uh, from father to son. That's a generation. And, uh, and uh, uh, the Bible sometimes uses the word that in that way. Uh, the Bible talks about the generation of evil. That is, that wicked wickedness will be in the world right up until the end. Uh, uh, the Bible uh, could be talking about the nation of Israel and uh, and uh, that it will not pass. And indeed, that uh, is, now we know, is, is, is exactly the way God has uh, is shown that it is still here as a nation, even though it looked like for almost 2,000 years that it was gone forever. But again, it, that prophecy has been fulfilled and it'll be a nation right up until the day of judgment just like all the other nations well thank you very much uh mr camping i appreciate it and uh so much enjoy uh your teaching on the radio thank you very much thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hi brother camping how you doing this evening yeah go ahead with your call Okay, I, I'm listening to the radio today on the family radio, and they were giving an advertisement today. And you were um, quoting, um, they had you quoting something in the Bible about... Uh, Did you, uh, uh, we had a call, yeah, I think you called earlier on family radio. And uh, please, we, I have, uh, we're, I we're going to have to take you off, I'm sorry. I haven't called for six And shall we, uh, uh, I'm sorry? And shall we take our next call? You, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, normally we're pretty accurate when we say that, uh, um, uh, oh, he was talking about something earlier, I understand, yeah. Well, sorry, I, I, I should have listened to you. I'm, I, uh, please forgive me. Uh, uh, shall we take our next call, please? We, we, we try to be very kind and very gentle, and, and <laughs> sometimes an individual will have a voice and mannerisms and a way of speaking that duplicates somebody else, and they're kind of in trouble. Because if we hear that same voice and mannerisms and so on, within 30 days we're not going to take the call. That's an unfortunate situation. But on the other hand, uh, most of the time we're able to detect that accurately, and and uh, so we just simply 
I want to follow the rule that people should call only once in uh, yeah, during the during the uh, uh, once a month because we have so many trying to get through. But we uh, that was our fault and we apologize. Shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Camp, and I want to look at Revelation chapter 22, verses uh, 18 through 21. Revelation 22, verse 18. There we read. Uh, there we read, for I testify that every, unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. And from the things that are written in this book, he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, what is your question? What is your... Oh, my, we lost that caller. Uh, and shall we take our next the call, thing, please? When it clearly says the add or take away and stuff. I, I'm sorry. What? Uh, what is your question? I said, you keep adding your own stupid formula to the thing on here when it clearly says that you can't add or take away from the Bible. Uh, it uh, is freaking hilarious that you just keep adding and taking away stuff from the Bible when that clearly says that. Well, excuse me, <laughs> where, what, have, what verse have I added to the Bible? What, uh, what, what have I said? The Bible, God told me this. And it is not written in the Bible. Right? I had a vision or I had a dream. Did you ever hear me say that? No, uh, but you keep saying that May 21st, 2011 is going to be the rapture. And that it seems like you're adding something there. Well, but the fact is that is derived directly from the Bible. Have you read uh, the, uh, the, uh, the way that was derived at? Have you re read a copy of We're Almost There carefully? Please get a copy of We're Almost There and read it carefully. And then if you have a criticism, please call me. And you can get that free of charge by simply calling or writing Family Radio, Oakland, California. Or you can call 1-800-543-1495 and ask for the book We're Almost There. And it will be sent to you without any cost of any kind. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Uh, I didn't quite get my, my question finished, and you thanked me for my call. I called about Samson, which yes. you said was, uh, was a believer. And I asked if, the, if Samson was, if you knew if he was saved at the end of his life since he didn't follow the uh, rule that you seem to have set down that a, a person wants to do the will of God, uh, that that is going to show that he's, a, he's really a believer, and yet Samson was a believer, and all through the Bible it didn't indicate that he followed the rule of God or wanted to do anything well, until excuse the very end of me. his life. Excuse me, what we don't know is, at what moment did God give him an eternal soul? Since he is named with those... Uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. He could have received an eternal soul the hour before he died. We have no information at all about that. But we all do know, we do know that he is named with the uh, people of faith in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And based on that, we say that in, uh, we'd have to believe that he was a child of God. Is, is, since Jesus came from a Jewish lineage, would he be considered a Jew? Jesus was absolutely a Jew. He All came. right, and, and so someone who becomes a, who is a Christian and becomes saved is a is a saved Christian really a spiritual Jew? Because absolutely, absolutely. We okay. read in Romans chapter two. Mm. Uh, in, in Romans chapter 2, God right. discusses this matter. Right. And he says there, uh, we're uh, in Romans chapter 
2, uh, he says, for he is a, uh, for, for verse 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, that is, is uh, has a blood descent from Abraham, neither is that circumcision, the fact that he was circumcised, uh, uh, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter. And more than than that, in Galatians, remember, in Galatians chapter, the last verse of chapter 3, we read there, and in verse 29, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. And Abraham is the beginning of the Jewish nation and heirs according to the promise. If ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed. You are spiritually a Jew. Right, right. Well, that's, that's what came to my mind. And, and a few nights ago, you were talking to someone who called and was asking about people keeping uh, the, the dietary law. And you, the first thing you said was, oh, that's for the Jews. And you made it sound like Christians that are believers were not Jews. And it oh, kind of excuse my me. antenna up a little bit. Excuse me. What I was saying is that is there are those who are Jews because they are, are blood descendants of Abraham and they have a Jewish uh, religion. It is not the religion of the Bible. They have a Jewish religion which is based, uh, uh, which includes some of the rules, some of the laws of the Old Testament, like the dietary laws. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Uh, you know, I had a question. I remember a while back you said to figure out the date of something, you would take it and divide it by 365.2422. And what is what would you actually divide? Like, what would be the number that you divide that from? I'm sorry. To get the day... You divide by, you never divide by 365.2422, but in order to get the number of days from one year to another year, you take the number of years, and at, some, at the same point in each of those two years uh, from that, that you're finding the number of days, multiply that number of days by 365.2422, and you get the actual number of days between those two points. Okay, that's where I was confused. And I had one more quick question for you. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. We're right at the end of our program. I wish I could talk to you, but we have no more time. Until our next open forum program, may let's keep studying the Bible carefully and praying for wisdom and praying for humility. We all need more of that. Good night.